This is Rob Tell for Boxing Social. Delighted to be joined here today by unbeaten cruiserweight prospect Richard Reakpour. We're down in lovely Loughborough um, ahead of your fight with Chris Billum Smith on the White Revas on the card. How are you doing, Richie? Yeah, I'm doing very well. Should I hold it? Oh, hold it. Okay. <laughs> I do think. Yeah, yeah, I'm doing well. Just been putting in the work, grafting, just the uh, same old pretty much as uh, my previous camps. That's it. When you say same old, um, this is the first time I've caught up with you in a while. For, for people who maybe weren't familiar with my recent, my previous work or kind of a couple of years back, we spent a lot of time together when you were, um, when you were training down in Brixton. You say same old, this is quite a lot different <laughs> to Miguel's <laughs> being here at Loughborough University. Um, amazing facilities here. Amazing state-of-the-art facilities, equipment, um, everything here, even to food. Obviously, you just saw us having dinner, down, lunch downstairs, and everything is clean. It's, this is like GB. This is like the GB camp setup, or probably a bit, um, a bit better than that, if anything. But it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. What was it like for you? Because I mean, Miguel's is kind of like spit and sawdust, very much like a. I don't know what what the word is. It's very more of a conventional type of boxing gym, whereas here, as you mentioned, it's it's similar to the GB setup. It's a lot of sports science. You have the newest this, the newest that. Explain to me the difference between the two. It's um, as you said, it's it's more specialized. So they work on different aspects. And let's, for instance, like they would work on a kinetic chain. Now, if we go back to Miguel's, it's all old school and old fashioned uh, in terms of training. But when we come here, everything is is studied. They study the body, they study the mass, they check the body fat percentage, they they check the diet, there's physios on site when we spar, when we train. It's it's a whole another level and that's where boxing has moved to from the old school. They've implemented uh, even Jerry Cooney came in and he said the same thing. He said, Listen, this would have been much much more fun. Like in the old days, we would just have like four sparring partners and we'd be boxing every single day. But here, it's, it's more specialised, it's, it's specific. So we may work on, on leg work, explosive power work, um, work on our balance, work on the cardiovascular system. Everything is just it's different. Whereas in the gym, it's just, just it's quite repetitive. It's quite repetitive. We don't do anything different, pretty much, than hit the heavy bags. Not that it's not beneficial for us in the ring. Of course it is. But now it's it's a new age, and the integration of science in boxing has changed the way fighters look, the way fighters perform, and to and essentially get the best out of it. Um, and in regards to performance, do you miss anything about kind of your camps at Miguel's, or is it very much kind of that's in the past now, and you you appreciate what you're doing here? No, no, I still I still miss that because there's something that I get from from the the grit. It's quite when when we go back to Brixton, it's, it's gritty, and it just reminds you of where you came from. That's why I love to go back there. I love to go Cuba. If we go Cuba now, they don't have nothing, like nothing. They have maybe one boxing room with just pieces of wood. There's gaps in the wood when you're moving around. With shadow boxing on concrete, uneven um, ground, but you just have to make deal with what you got. But if you see the skill. And the movement of the fighters, you would think that they're training in a setup like this, or probably even a better setup than, than this. But it's all about you. And sometimes it's like, you know, there's a saying, it's harder for a boxer to get up and run when his bed is made of velvet. Mm. Sometimes you need to feel that roughness. So you, it just gives you more drive, more, more hunger to achieve your goals. So, yeah, I love it. I love it. I love the mixture of both. Now... You're fighting Chris Billingsworth on July 20th. Um, I think it's fair to say a couple of fights ago, you had your, your kind of big step up moment against Sam Hyde. It was on the Usyk Bailey undercard in Manchester. Um, explain to me your performance then, because I want to come on to your Tommy McCarthy performance, which yeah. is quite a lot different to your Sam Hyde performance. Talk to me about the Sam Hyde fight. So Sam Hyde, a lot of people had me obviously beating Sam Hyde and just solely based on my power, my my size reach, but Sam Hyde is a very good boxer. And obviously we saw everybody saw him tonight. Obviously I didn't use my attributes pretty much. I was quite a, quite flustered by the environment, the whole occasion. It quite fr um, threw me off and I underperformed. Like, but f 
obviously I've been given, um, I've been gifted with uh, with serious serious amount of power, and I was able to put it back. But at the same time, I had to dig deep. I had to dig deep to get that W. But we ended up getting it, and we moved on, learned from our mistakes, and we aim to implement, obviously, to improve on our faults, basically, pretty much of what we did in the Sam High fight, in Tom, the Tommy McCarthy fight. A lot of people thought, you know what? That's that's an even bigger step up than Sam Hyde, and you perform, perform like that against Sam Hyde, you're gonna get outboxed. And I said, mm, okay, don't worry, don't worry, no problem, because. Me, I don't mind. You see, when people doubt me and things like that, it actually drives me even more. So, psh, I don't care what people think. I don't care whether they say I'm going to knock out my opponent in one round because I don't buy into what the crit critics think. I think I'll focus on what I need to do to secure the W, to get the win. That's that's my main aim. And I'm going to do what I need to do. By any means necessary, I'm going to have to win. It's that simple. So, the, um, the Sam Hyde fight, I, I was actually... So I had breakfast with Dillian, who obviously looks after your, your affairs, some of your manager as well as fighting, um, the next morning. And he kind of said the same thing that you've just <coughs> said there about potentially the stage getting to you, but ultimately you got the win, you won the title, and it's on to the next one. Your next performance, as I mentioned against Tommy McCarthy, was a lot different. It was you, you looked ready to be on that stage, you looked ready to, to perform. I mean, I've seen you in the gym, I've seen you sparring with Dillian over the years. The Tommy McCarthy fight was the Richard Riappol we see in the gym. Yeah. Did you need to go through the Sam Hyde experience to, to have that? Was that a, a big help for you going into that Tommy McCarthy performance? Yes, 100%. Because a lot of fighters, they, they don't understand the way this game works. Everybody wants to be on a stage. Everybody wants to have their name. Everybody wants to be on Sky Sports and, and be on primetime television. Now, there's certain, there's certain experiences that you need to go through to be able to perform like Tony Bellews and, and the David Hayes and Anthony Joshua as Dillian White. And sometimes, it, most times, it just comes from experience itself. Now, I never experienced that. Come from small hall shows, and you've seen my growth. I've, I've been boxing on small hall shows, you know, a few, few people in the crowd shine your name, not too many, um, not too much lighting. And it's just like, it's, it's similar to the gym. You just relax, it's, it's easy going. But when you get onto this stage now, and you hear the people, the, the thousands of people screaming. You see the lights, the cameras. You become conscious of it. And you think, you know what, I just want to be perfect. And that's the downfall sometimes because that's when you start making silly mistakes, start doing things that you don't normally do. Mm. And I think that kind of affected me. And that's what I went through pretty much on, on that show. So going into the Tommy McCarthy fight, I just said to myself, listen, I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to relax. I already know what I'm capable of. I know I got um, probably the hardest punch, one of the hardest. I'm um, one of the hardest punches in the world, and I know I got good boxing capabilities. Like I, it's simple. I got long reach. I got height. You know, I got you know attributes that are, you know boxers wish they had. So let me just use it and enjoy myself. Enjoy the moment. Now you mentioned that Chris Billum Smith hasn't been on this stage before. It's something that I spoke to him about yesterday when I was in the gym with him. Um, you had your kind of, not, both the Tommy McCarthy fight and the Sam Hyde fight were difficult fights, but the first Sam Hyde fight on that platform for the first time, you've done that, he hasn't. How do you feel that he's going to react to that? I don't know. You know, to be honest, it could go either way. He could, you know, he could uh, relish the moment and just perform great and just kind of just soak, in, soak up the atmosphere pretty well. Or it could completely backfire like it did with me and Sam Hyde. And he could just throw off his game. So it all depends. It, sometimes it depends on, on one's mental fortitude. You know, if you're not really strong mentally, you haven't been through anything, it's like, can you just reach that reserve where you think, flip it, you know? I'm just gonna give it, give it what I got. I don't care who's watching, I don't care what people think about me. But I don't know, everybody's different. That's where I came from. That's the background that we came from. That's why we're able to find a way to win in the end, even even if we're down in the cards. And not everybody's got that, to be honest. Not everybody's got that, and, and it shows. So, Dillian, Dillian White, you know, you know, he's got that. He's got that. And it kind of rubs off as well. We came from the same place, places, um, same background. So, 
I think that kind of things that I've been through in life kind of helped me to be able to perform under these in in these situations. But to be honest, I don't know with Chris Bill and Smith. I don't know anything. That's like I said before. I don't really know anything about him. I don't know if he's been through any struggles in his life. I don't know if he's um, had to overcome some serious adversity to to be able to box and perform or be where he is pretty much right now. So that's what he needs to ask himself. And it, and it only it's all it's all fun and games. Well, no, it's all fun and games. So we actually face off at the at the weigh-in. And he, he honestly sees the fire in my eyes and the hunger. He realizes, listen, we've got kids to feed at home. We came from nothing. We've got a whole community that that referenced me as a, as a person that they look up to, that they want, they strive to be like. And I've got that the whole weight on my shoulders, and I have to win no matter what. That's that's my mindset. So I don't know if he's got that that same type of mindset, or he can just I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. But. We'll, we'll just have to wait and see. And talk to me a little bit about that. I mean, I've, I have known you for for a long time, but we've never really spoken about it on camera. I mean, you mentioned kind of the hardships and the struggles that you've been through. I know you do now a lot of outreach work within mm -hmm. schools and kind of spreading very positive messages to people, but it may surprise people watching this because you are a very, a very charming, nice, well-spoken man. Um, but I think you'd agree that it's not always been that way for you. No. Why don't you Why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and kind of your story? So yeah, kind of like I've been through everything, man. I've been through everything, and I was nearly killed at 15. Been to jail. Been to. I've been through it all. You know, you could just use your imagination. And it got to a point where I just I said to myself, I have to change my life now, because. Uh, the end goal, it's, it doesn't look pretty. Like there's there's two routes. I, f I thought to myself, there's going to be two routes at the end of this. Everybody thinks that they're going to go through this type of lifestyle and end up very rich, like like you know some characters from the movies or something or a fictional story, or they're just gonna they're just gonna um, they're gonna get killed. Or so I just thought, you know what? I'm going to be that 10% that's that's going to make it. But really, it's not 10%. It's one percent. It's one percent, even if that. So I just thought to myself, I need to secure my future and do something legit. Do something that's where I can invest in, invest in and change my life. So I just thought, you know what? Let me just try out boxing. Let me try out a sport. I'm very competitive and I'm athletic. So that's when I decided to to obviously box. But during during my decision a few people came up to me and they gave me advice. They said, Richard, don't put all your eggs in one basket because you don't know how things can pan out in the future. To be honest, I took it offensively. I thought, well, you don't believe in my ability that I could you know, make it. It'll be pretty much successful. I'm giving this everything. But then as I got older, I realized that they, they have a point. So I decided to study. I went to college, did an access course to get into uni, studied government and politics, psychology, sociology, Got into Kingston University, started marketing, communications and advertising, graduated and after that I went pro. So where I came from, it's like, it's, 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 sur it's surreal to some people. It's like, they know me from back in the days. So they know exactly what I have, I've had to overcome to get to my position now and it seems like it's, it's like a movie. I might bring out a movie soon as well. So, you know, and I don't glorify anything that I've been through. I, I go out now to different schools, different institutions, and I speak to children, I speak to students, and I tell them, listen, this is my life. This is what I had to overcome to get here, and it wasn't difficult. Now, prevention is better than cure. Don't make this decision, because that's not going to be beneficial. Go this route, go that route, go that route. You don't have to listen to me, but I'm here to advise you and look at me. This is, this is the result. What I tend to notice is that a lot of students and and a lot of people they want to see a type of um, they want to see everybody. It's like a materialistic um, society that we live in, so they want to see something tangible. What have you got? What's your car? What, what car are you driving? How much money did you get paid for your last fight? You know. But obviously, we're moving there. So once I achieve more things and people are able to see more, they're going to be like, you know what, Richard did this. I'm gonna I'm 
I'm going to do this and that's the drive, that's the drive, that's what we're training, putting ourselves through torture every single day in the gym, day after day, day after day and it's a life full of sacrifices and and it's cool, I'm I'm ready to be that, that take that sacrifice to, to affect and add value to the world. Now you mentioned the fact that you nearly lost your life at 15 years old as a result of knife crime, as a result of a, a knife injury. Um, it's a problem that is still, if not, not it still exists, but if not worse today, I mean, London in particular has a very, very serious knife epidemic at the minute. What do you feel, I mean, particularly as somebody who's been on both sides of it, somebody who's experienced it and is now trying to help implement change, what do you think we can do as a society to help tackle issues like knife crime? It's a difficult one, but I know one of the main, one, one idea that I've had in my head is for people like myself that have been through that type of background are push more on, on major platforms and, and use as a reference that if Richard could do this, then that means you can. He's been through what you've been through. He talks just like you. He grew up where you grew up. So you can see yourself, you can almost see yourself in that person. And it could be people from all different types of sports or not even in, in this field of sport, in business and stuff it's like, look, this person came from where you came from. Look what he's doing now. Like, and that needs to be pushed, pushed and pushed and pushed. So it's, I think that would be great. I think they should focus on, on building some more youth clubs, even though that takes up a huge budget, of course, I know. And with, this, with the GDP and, and the deficits, they're trying to fit in, cut back on a lot of things, and, and it's understandable. But with a type of epidemic like this, this should also be prioritised. I, I heard the other day that some, a woman got stabbed with a, with a pregnant child. Mm. They delivered the child, and then the child died. Like, I've never heard of that before. It's, it's insane. Back in my day, it's like, it, was, it wasn't like that. I didn't hear about a pregnant woman getting k and killed because of knife crime. It's, it's really sad and it's depressing. And there's a lot of people that came from this, my background and they're trying their best to do what they can to help society and change it as, as much as they can. I talk to these youths any way I can, you know, because they don't have like value for life to, um, um, and that's pretty sad, so yeah. You mentioned kind of you, you looked at the path that you were going down and you identified, well, two different paths and neither of them were particularly good. Yeah. Was there a moment that kind of made you feel that way? Was there an incident that particularly happened or was it just kind of you'd come to the end of the line or was there a specific moment where you thought, okay, this is definitely not for me? I think it was a, it was a, it was a bunch of variables that affected my decision. Me um, getting stabbed, of course, that was one of the main ones, but that didn't com entirely change me and make me want to go down a certain path. I just wanted to get a knife to make sure that I didn't get stabbed and I had protection on me, that's all. <laughs> um, but then it's just more sitting down and looking at everything in hindsight and a different perspective and saying to myself, the path that I'm going down, it's not gonna, it's not gonna end up pretty if I continue walking down this path. You know, I don't know people like, it's, no, it's, it's crazy to go into, but to just put it in simple terms, it's just, I had to look er at everything in perspective and make a decision. And that's what I've done. And I went through with that decision and it changed my life and now I'm here today. But there's a few of my friends that are doing life in prison. There's a few of my friends that have died, have died and you know, and it's pretty sad. It's it's pretty sad. They, my fa um, their families are broken, and it's, it will never be the same again. People don't understand what death does to to a family and to a community. And the more understanding they get, and the more knowledge they um, they get, they would understand that you know certain actions are just not worth it. The the effect is could be detrimental to a whole community, let alone one particularly particular family or a group of, of boys around the area so people need to consider taking certain actions and we've you've mentioned his name and we've kind of alluded to him throughout this interview Dillian White who's obviously your, your final undercard but 
You're a very close knit bunch of guys. Yourself, John Harding. I know Chris Congo isn't with the team anymore, but I know that you've been very close with Chris for a long time. And Dillian, explain to me if you can Dillian's impact on your career, what he's done for you from the the time where you first. I know you've known him pre boxing, but the time that you you first kind of looked to him for advice really regarding your boxing career. Yeah, so Dillian took me under his wing, and he showed me. The ropes. He showed me how this boxing business works, how we can get to the top, and how to stay at the top. Pretty much, things that he's learned in his in his um, career so far, and and also just that ability to trust in somebody. You know, a lot of fighters don't have that. They can't trust in in certain people because these people. T- <laughs> You know, just to be frank, it's it's like a savage business. Like some people, they don't they don't really care about you, really. They couldn't care less whether you're you're starring or you have a speech impairment after a fight. They just care about the money, the money. That's what it's about. How much money can you make me? You're an investment. You're a product. That's all it is. And it's, yeah, it's fine to say you're a product, but as long as we're getting what we need out of it. But it's sad when you're a product and you're giving it your all, but you're getting underpaid. You're not getting your worth, and that's that's pretty sad. And that's where Dillian came in and said, "Listen, you're gonna get, you know, get what you deserve. You're not gonna make the same mistakes that I've made. You're gonna stay on this route, and we're gonna. It's gonna be easier for you. Simple. That's what he said to me. It's gonna be easier for you. I've been through hell, but look, you got the path. We know exactly where you can go. That's why I ended up taking the the deal with Dillian in the end, and everything has been successful pretty much so far." A lot of people don't well, will know Dillian from kind of interviews or, or seeing him on TV. What's he like away from the cameras? He's always happy. He's always happy. He's always joking about. He's fun. Um, that's it. That's it. Pretty much. He's just he's always in a, a good mood. He's just very humorous individual. Very humorous. He don't take life too seriously. And you will notice that even if you see him on fight night, we'll be cracking jokes, walking around. You will think, are you fighting today? <laughs> And that's kind of the the notion that we take to to life and to everything we do when we come to the fights. We just joke, joke and chill. That's all it is. How beneficial is that for you at this point of your career to ha- kind of have such a a personal relationship with Dylan, who is in these big fights? I mean, he's fighting on pay per view again. Um, being around him on those big fight nights, whether it's at the O2 or elsewhere, how beneficial is that to you at this point of your career? Yeah, it's an absolute blessing. You know, being able to get an insight from somebody that's actually boxing at, at such a high level at the, at the world stage now, pay-per-view, um, pay-per-view um, fighter at that. It's, what more could you ask for? I see, I've seen like other famous um, fighters manage a, a, diff- um, a lot of boxers, but I'd never see them together training and them having like intimate conversations and stuff. And with Dillian, check on my social media, check on my Instagram. You always see Dillian there us cracking jokes, Dylan always promoting me, talking about me in, in the interviews and stuff. I never asked him to because I believe in making my, my name myself. I don't, you know, at the end of the day, I'm getting in the ring and I'm, I'm fighting. So I just, I know that I'll make a pathway for myself, make my own name, but he's just trying to help me as much as he can. Like, what more could you ask for? So I, I believe I'm truly, truly blessed. How's his fight going to go with Oscar Rivas? Oscar Rivas, not massively well known to the casual audience over here, but obviously I think if you kind of follow the sport closely, you know that he's very, very capable. What do you make of that fight? Yeah, so Rivas, I just see him getting knocked out sometime in that fight. I see him getting knocked out. I see him eating a big jab and eating some eating some big shots. He might even overreach, walk to a big shot, get himself knocked out. That's that's how I see it going. Um, he may cause um, a little bit of trouble, or he may not. And I I believe you. I don't think he will cause cause trouble, cause any trouble. He's fast. He's a come forward fighter. And he's he's got a decent boxing IQ. But I feel like he um, he doesn't really sm- smother his work. But I think it's just, it's a perfect fight for Dillian's style. That's why I feel like Dillian's got Dillian's big. He's stronger. And he's got a serious boxing IQ too, so yeah, I just see it going one way. 
And just finally, uh, we spoke about this off camera, you were in New York at the same time as me. Didn't come and meet me for a cup of coffee, but that's fine. Um, <laughs> yeah, to be fair, if, if, you, if you want to enjoy yourself outside of camp and, and avoid people like me, that's, that's fine. That's absolutely understandable. Um, you were there for the Anthony Joshua Andy Ruiz fight. Um, talk to me about the fight. Oh, man, that was, it was shocking. It was shocking to see, you know, what happened. Even the undercard was pretty good. Katie Taylor... Um, who else? Um, Josh Kelly. Great fight. Very entertaining. But Joshua, I just feel like something happened prior to before that fight. Because you can just see in his body language, his demeanour. Came into the ring, leaning on the ropes, chewing his gum short. I've ne even in amateurs, I've never... If I ever did that, they will slap me on, on my shoulder saying, Richard, bounce up, look lively. What's going on? But nobody was saying anything to him. It's like they knew exactly what happened as well. So they're just letting him do his thing. And there's like, something's going on. And I think once he hurt Ruiz, put him down, he wanted to overly impress. And you can see it by his, by his actions. He came, he left himself wide open and he ended up getting um, a, sh a shot to the, to the top of the head, which um, uh, effectively messed up his equilibrium. And he could never recover after that. But I feel like he, he, I feel like he was beaten by himself, mentally. I don't know why. I don't know what happened. But coming back to that fight, he needs to obviously solve that issue. Maybe see a psychologist. And um, come and get his belts back. He's, he's more than capable. He's he's got the the power. He's got the height, athleticism. Maybe too much muscle. But you can rectify that. He's got decent amount of time to do so. So I think he can do that. But I think about the hunger. Is the hunger still there? Because man, that's, if I was to achieve everything in boxing, become a, a unified world champion, make millions of, of, of pounds, and then go against somebody where, where they didn't look aesthetically pleasing to the eye and I didn't take the fight seriously, and I wasn't getting the fights that I wanted, could I perform? I don't know. And if I lost, would I be able to perform again? Would I have the same drive and hunger when I'm rich already? My bed, my bed is made from velvet. I don't know. I don't know. It's going to be hard. He's going to have to find it from somewhere. And it's like, what's the drive? Do you know what I mean? What's the drive? I've got so much um, reasons why I should, I should, I should drive to be and strive to be successful. But with him, I don't know. I don't know. And that's the. That's why I kind of uh, I worry. I worry about that fight. You know, Joshua is a nice guy. He's a friend of mine as well, and I want I wish him all the best. And he just needs to find find that flipping reserve, man, and just tap into it and go for it. Get his titles back. Keep it keep it simple. Jab and move. Jab and move. Jab and move. When he sees the opening, just smack him. That's it. Simple. It's quite a good breakdown. I quite like that. Yeah. Maybe maybe a job for you in um in the media or afterwards. Yeah. Maybe. Um okay, well Richard React Paul, real pleasure to catch up with you. Um as I kind of mentioned at the start of the interview, you're somebody who I have probably a longer relationship with the most in the sport. Um very much looking forward to your fight with Chris Bill and Smith, who is also a friend of mine. I hope that both of you perform to the best of your capabilities on the night and leave the ring healthy. Um, Thank you very much. Thanks very much for speaking to Boxing Social. Thank you. Richard Reactport. Cheers, man. Thank you for having me.